and God for them. If you have had your Bible, we want you to roll with us real quick. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 37, okay? I want you to roll with us real quick if we go to Genesis chapter 7. chapter 37, and once you get there, just give me a old-fashioned amen. amen. If you're not there yet, just say, hold on, man. It's all right. <coughs> Genesis chapter 37, beginning at verse 1. We ask if you can and will, if you'll stand for the reading of the word. I'm going to read a couple of verses here from the Eugene Peterson message translation. So if you got um, your device, you just hit in the Bible in the corner up there and it'll change it to the MSG, that's the Eugene Peterson message translation. And it reads like this. Verse number one, meanwhile, Jacob had settled down where his father had lived, the land of Canaan. This is the story of Jacob. The story continues with Joseph, 17 years old at the time, helped herding the flocks. These were his half-brothers, actually, the sons of his father's wives, Bella and Zephah, and Joseph brought his father bad reports on them. Verse 3 and 4, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he, had, he was his child of his old age, and he made him an elaborately embroidered coat. When his brothers realized that their father loved him more than them, they grew to hate him. They wouldn't even speak to him. Joseph had a dream when he told it to his brothers. They hated him even more. He said, listen to this dream I had. We were all out in the field gathering bundles of wheat. All of a sudden, my bundle stood straight up, and your bundle circled around and bowed down to mine. His brother said, so you're going to rule us? You're going to boss us around? And they hated him even more then, even more than ever, because of his dream and the way he talked. Verse number nine, he had another dream. He told this one also to his brothers. I dreamed another dream, the sun and the moon and even and 11 stars bowed down to me. When he told it to his father and brothers, his father reprimanded him or rebuked him. What's with all this dreaming? Am I and your mother and your brothers all supposed to bow down to you? Now his brothers were really jealous. But his father brought it over or pondered over the whole business. His brothers had gone off to Shechem where they were pasturing their father's flock. Israel said to Joseph, your brothers are with the flocks in Shechem. Come, I want to send you to them. Joseph said, I'm ready. Thank God for the reading of the word, the word of God. Amen. For the people of God, you may have your seats. Just for the sake of preaching, I want to read just this one last verse 12 and 13 actually his brothers had gone off to Shechem where they were pasturing their father's flock Israel said to Joseph your brothers are with the flocks in Shechem come I want to send you to them Joseph said I'm ready Amen. brothers and sisters friends and family um, this is going to be relatively interesting month for us because those of you that's been hanging out with us for a while you know that this year is the year of breakthrough for us and this month happens to be the month of breaking through poor relationships so this month we're going to deal with our relationship series and preferably um, it will be impactful to you to the way I think it has already been impactful to me um, and dealing with that I want to start off today just to give you a little insight is that there's certain things sometimes when in relationships, Tish, that you don't ever want to hear. In fact, on Instagram, my Instagram story about a week ago, I posted several things, fellas, that men don't like to hear when in relationship. One of the things that I believe brothers don't like to hear is can we talk? Um, because brothers, y'all sit real quiet, but typically when she comes in and says, can we talk? There's some things that need to be discussed in a manner that you really don't want to have conversation. There's other things, um, fellas, if you're dating a young lady, that you don't ever want to hear her say. And one of the things that I believe that you don't want to hear somebody say um, if you're in a relationship with them is that this just ain't going to work. 
And what I want to preach to you from this subject this morning, close to afternoon, I want to talk to you from this subject. This just ain't going to work. This just ain't going to work. Um, it's, it's interesting in Genesis chapter 37 um, because Genesis is broken down into sections and chapter 37 to chapter 50 is actually the ending section of Genesis and it's one of the, um, according to scholars, it's one of the, the greatest narrative form literature that has ever been written biblically. Many of them compare it to um, the, the narrative of the life of David and of Moses. And for those of you, um, you don't even have to be a biblical scholar to know about Moses and to know about David because it's such great literature, it's such a great narrative. And many scholars have said that this portion of Genesis from chapter 37 to chapter 50 is one of the greatest written forms of narrative literature in ancient, um, in ancient times. So for us to get to chapter 37, we have to go back a little bit and rewind back to chapter 28. So for those that have been kicking it with us here at Impact, you know that we've been on a journey from Genesis chapter 12, and we're going all the way to Revelation. I don't know how long that's going to take us. All I know is that we're on a journey. And here in chapter 37, we have to look back at chapter 28. For those of you that remember in chapter 28, um, it was interesting because Jacob is on the run from his brother Esau. Esau has already threatened his life, has put a hit out on him, and wants to take his life. And Jacob is on the run. He's leaving from his father's house, and he's headed down to Pandan Aram, where his uncle Laban is. While on his way, he stops at a place to get some rest. He stops in a town or a village called Bethel. And we've already distinguished and determined that Bethel translated simply means the house of God. So he goes to Bethel, he lays down, and he puts his head on a rock. And y'all remember we shouted like crazy in here because Christologically, the study of Christ or the center of Christ, the rock represented Jesus the Christ. So he laid his head down on the rock, which is Jesus the Christ. And he has a dream. And for the first time in Jacob's life, he has an encounter at Bethel, the house of God. He has an encounter with God through a dream. But when Jacob wakes up, we talked about Jacob offers a deal to God. Jacob says, listen, God, if you will protect me, if you will be with me and protect me on this journey, if you'll make sure I got food to eat, clothes to wear, and if you will make sure that I come back to my father's house safely, then you will be my God. So Jacob offers a deal with God. And this is what happens nine chapters later, from chapter 28 to chapter 37, Jacob has finally made it back to his father's house. Y'all with me? He's finally made it back to his father's house nine chapters later. And this is a testament to the faithfulness of God. Let me show you why. Because what we have to realize is, Coach P, God never said okay to the deal that Jacob offered. Okay, God never said, okay, Jacob, this is a real good deal. I'm with your deal. I can help you with your deal. God never says, Jacob, I'm for the deal. The only thing we see is that later, nine chapters later, that now what Jacob asked for, God has did it. And the reason that this should be a celebratory moment for us, the reason that this should be a time for us to shout, is because we get discouraged when God doesn't say anything. Have you ever been in a situation where God, where you were praying to God and it seemed as if God was not responding to you? Have you ever been fasting before and it seemed as if God wasn't saying anything to you? Has anybody other than me ever had a situation where you were meant in the midst of God, but it felt like God was not saying anything? Have you ever had a time where you were fasting and praying, giving, coming to church, and it felt like God wasn't saying nothing? And we find ourselves, Macy, in places of total discouragement when God is not saying nothing. But hopefully you'll put this in your notes and it'll get you excited and help you go through the next week. But this is what I learned, Miss Joanne. Just because God ain't talking don't mean God ain't working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, got, you, you, you got to learn in life that just because you don't hear God speaking to you don't mean that God is not working on your behalf. And in Jacob's situation, God didn't say anything, but God was working on Jacob's behalf. So Jacob has finally made it, finally made it back to his father's house, Mama Lord. After all this time, he's journeyed back to his father's house. God has allowed him to make it back to his father's house. And this is what verse number one says. And Jacob made it back to his father's house or his father's land in Canaan. But here's what verse two says. Verse 2 says, and Jacob, who has now made it back, and remember, Jacob is back, but his family is different because his mama, Rebecca, has died. 
His father Isaac has died. His mama's nurse Deborah has died. And the wife Rachel, who he loved the most, has also died. So this family dynamic looks totally different now. He has a totally different structure of family because the only people left is his wife Leah and two wives on the side that he never loved and all of his children. So his family dynamic looks different, but he's made it back home safely. And this is what I want you to see really quick. He's come back home and verse 2 says, and now this is the story of Jacob's life and it begins telling us about Joseph. And this is interesting because it tells us about Joseph who's now 17 years old. And why this is catchy, because it helps us to see the format, the structure of the model of what secession should look like. And this is only going to make sense to a few people that have, been, have grown up in rural areas and you have watched leaders die in the poor people. Okay, y'all real quiet today. Maybe I got to walk this real slow. Or maybe it's a business, and when the leader or the founder of the business dies, the business goes down. Or maybe you've been a part of a church where the pastor preached at the church for 90 years, and when the pastor died, the church went down because there was no structured secession plan. And in our rural areas, in many of our communities, we struggle with preparing the next generation. So why the generation before us right now is so busy pointing a finger and beating our generation down, it's not this generation. Fault. It's the fact that the generation before us can prepare us to take on what's next. And we spend so much time worried about what's happening right now that we don't prepare the generation for what's going to happen next. And let me just give you this nugget so you already know. I don't plan to pastor until I die. All right, right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. But by the time I hit 55 or 60, I plan to be on a beach somewhere enjoying my life with a little cup with a colored drink inside of it, having a little good time because I'm not going to do this until I die. I want to find somebody, Joseph, that's 17, that you can prepare to take it on next. And we struggle, and I want to let you know, you don't have to die in leadership. Come here, Michael Jordan. Thank you for passing on to Kobe. Come here, Kobe. Thank you for passing on LeBron. Come here, LeBron. Thank you for passing to the Steph or Katie, whichever one. Thank you for showing us the model of passing on the torch. This is the biblical model of what succession should look like. You don't have to die in leadership. You don't have to die pastors preaching in the pulpit. You don't have to die being the only one that knows how the organization runs. You have to pass it on. Yes. And this is important because it leads us into this story with Jacob and Joseph. And what's happening is we find Joseph, 17 years old, in a unique place. Because when we get to verse 3 and 4, it says that Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons because he was born to him late in age. So this is what he did because he loved Joseph. He made a mama horn a, a lovely embroidered coat. For most of you that are traditional like me, he made him a coat of many colors. For those of you in the 21st century, he made him a Louis Vuitton coat. So he made him a really nice coat because he loved him. But this is what I need you to catch so we can walk into our courts because I can't wait to get to this. Listen to this. In verse 1, he's called Jacob. In verse 2, he's called Jacob again. But in verse 3, he's called Israel. So we understand that Jacob's name meant supplanter. He'll grasp the tricks, the manipulative, deceptive. We understand Jacob's name means something totally different. But Israel meant I've wrestled with God or God is with me. So y'all, this messed me up. Because I'm trying to figure out, God, why do we keep seeing this happen? Why do we keep seeing the interchanging of Joseph and Israel's name? They're the same person, but one breath he's called Jacob, the next breath he's called Israel. The other time that we see this is in chapter 35. When Diana was raped, he was called Jacob before the rape, but while she was being raped, he was called Israel. After the rape, he was called Jacob again. So I started wrestling with God. God, why? The certain situations is he called Israel, but other circumstances he's called Jacob. And what God revealed to me is that at moments like this, the writer does not even have a clue that God is using him to highlight a connection, not with the person, but the person and God. So here it is. Diana's issue is when she gets raped, she's going to lose all respect in society. So she's going to be cast out. She can't marry anybody else. But what they show us is Israel speaks because Israel is with God. Israel wrestles with God. So despite what society says about Diana, the text shows us that she still has a relationship with God. Some of you should have been shouting right there. Because the reality of this thing is, if some people were able to dictate your life and who you are by the things that you've done, they'll cast you down, talk about you, throw you away. But aren't you glad that despite 
like what you got in your life, you still have the ability to have a relationship with God? Yes, yes. So, so, some of y'all, they, they yes. listen just for me because I'm so glad that all the trifling stuff I've done in my life, all the lies I told, all the deceptive stuff I've God, I thank you yes. that when people don't have a relationship with me, I still have a relationship with God. When folks talk about you stabbing in your back, lying on you, stealing from you, I still got a relationship with God. When I'm filthy and nasty in the eyes of everybody else, I'm so glad I still got a relationship with God. You don't have to worry about what other people say about you anymore. Why, Craig? Because you still got a relationship with God. And this is what happens, Tiger. We see now that there's relationship with Israel and Joseph. And this is figurative to a relationship between Joseph and God. Uh And here's our first thought today. Why certain relationships don't work? Number one is because they're based on a shaky foundation. Wow. <laughs> Praise God. Right. Let, me, let me show y'all why. Um, watch, watch, watch why. What, what do you mean shaky foundation? The text says that Israel loved Joseph. Uh-huh. Which we just figured out is symbolic or metaphorical to God loving Joseph. Uh-huh. So God loves Joseph more than the other sons, and God gives Joseph a special blessing. But here's the problem to why so many of our relationships fail. Here's why so many of us hear that this just can't work, because we try to build relationships on a rocky or a shaky foundation. In other words, teachers, we try to build relationship without God. Okay, let, let, let me walk through this thing, because I've been excited about this all year. Here it is. This is what we do. We have moral standards that are deal breakers. But your God standard, you lower. Let me talk to some sisters. So you don't date him if he ain't got no job, but you don't mind if he don't pray. Okay, all right. So, so you, you don't marry him if he ain't making six figures, but you don't mind if he don't know how to worship. And see, many of us have failed at relationships, not because that joke ain't got Jacob 
becomes Israel in verse with Joseph. And the text says that he has such a relationship with his son that he goes over to Mama Warren's house and gets her to sew together a coat of many colors and he gives a coat of many colors to his son because he loved him more than the rest of them. But watch what verse 4 says. Verse 4 says, and when the brothers realize that their father, y'all gotta watch this now, watch how the words are written. When the brothers realize that the father, when the brothers realize that the father loved Joseph more than the other sons, watch what they do. They hated him and they wouldn't speak to him. <laughs> watch what happens. Here's another reason why relationships fail. Because, number one, this is like a point A and point B, right? The first part is spiritual. Here's the reason why relationships fail. It's because many relationships are based upon other people's issues with God. Oh. Okay, what, what are you saying, Craig? Um, it, let, let me see how simple I can make this. Um, some people don't really have a problem with you. Right. They got a problem with the relationship with God. So because you're not saved the way they expect you to be saved, then you can't be saved. Okay, yeah, let, let me give you my story um, real quick. Um, th this, is, this is a very interesting story, Mariah. Uh, you'll have many of these when you come back from college, preferably not like mine, but you'll have many stories. Um, th th this is what happened to me. Um, I, I, I can't tell y'all where, because y'all probably figured out, but it was in another state um, several years ago. I went to preach, and I was preaching at a youth conference, a huge youth conference. So I wanted to get there a day early. I had to preach Sunday at the 1015 service. The 1015 service is the jumping service. That's where all the young people at. That's the popping service is lit. And my partner that went with me, he had the 730 service. I'm good. I don't like to preach 730 anyway. I got a 1015 service. So we get down there on Saturday. So I'm going to tell y'all this. This is probably the only time I'll publicly um, give, you, give you some insight and brag on myself. But your pastor is cool. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. I'll just wait for one confirmation. So I'm a real cool dude. So when I get to a place, Miss Joanne, I don't do a whole lot of talking. I'm real cool, and I like attention, but I'm never, I'm never overly seeking attention. So I'm not the dude that's gonna be in a room that's gonna make a lot of noise and get attention. If I want attention, I'm gonna walk by a couple times. Y'all understand? Huh? She's looking phenomenal. I see her. She come up to me. I'm thinking, okay, this about to be good. 
She hugged me like a sideways hug. I'm tripping because that ain't how we hugged last night. So she hugged me sideways and she whispers to me. She says, how can you stand up there and preach and pray for people when you know what we did last night? Now I'm tripping because we ain't do a whole lot. There's a million other things that we could have did. But I'm trying to figure out what is she talking about. She said, she's whispering, people trying to shake my hand, trying to talk to me. She said, why? How can you preach and pray for people when you know what we did last night? I told her, I said, listen, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I said, I never stand in God's pulpit without first having a conversation of forgiveness with God. So despite what I had in my cup, Y'all missed it. Uh, despite what I did with the hug, I already had a conversation with God for me. And the problem was, because after that, I told her, I said, listen, there, there, there's no hard feelings, but um, I've already taken a bite of the forbidden fruit. This is what I told her. I chewed it up, I digested it, and it's already been wasted. I'll talk to you later. So I want that. So, so she, for the next four days, she texted and I never responded. And one of her text messages told me, she said, my issue wasn't with you. I just didn't understand how I can do what I did and come to church on Sunday and you can stand and do what you did. And I texted back, I said, the difference is I know how to repent, you don't. Oh, yes. So what I'm saying yes. is some people mess up their relationship with you because they don't have a relationship with themselves with God. So they can't understand how can you repent from something and move on, but they're still stuck in the place they're stuck oh.
And this causes relationships to fail when you don't deal with what's happening at home. Let me show y'all this. Y'all all right with me? Yes. Can I walk through this thing this month? Listen to this. It says, Israel loved him more than any of his other sons because he was a child of his old age, and he made him elaborately and brought a coat. When his brothers realized that their father loved him more than them, they grew to hate him. They wouldn't even speak to him. Watch this. Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Listen to this. He said, listen to this dream I had. We were all in the field gathering bundles of wheat. All of a sudden, my bundle stood up straight, and your bundle circled around and bowed down to mine. His brother said, so you're going to rule us? You're going to boss us around? Listen to this. And they hated him more than ever because of his dream. And here's the part that blessed me. And because the way he talked. Well, can I give y'all another reason why relationships fail? Because uh -huh. you don't know how to talk. Oh, all right, y'all right, real quiet on this day. That's all right, though. We're going to walk through this thing. Yeah. Listen to what it says. We always shout and we always criticize the brothers raving in this text because we say Joseph was just a dreamer and they're just haters and they're hating on the dreamer. But this text says they hated him not only because of the dream, but because of the arrogant way he talked. Let me talk to some sisters in the 21st century. You got to be careful how you talk to men nowadays. Mm -hmm. Because one of the issues in our 21st century is that we're so busy empowering and building women, but we're talking and tearing down men. Amen. So every woman is wonderful, magnificent, and educated, and every brother is a dog and no good and can't ever get it right, ain't got no job, still living with his mama, he ain't no good. And we're tearing down men by the way we talk, and you wonder why you're still single. Amen. That's you wonder why relationships keep failing. Because we have not learned how to talk to our husband at home. We have not learned how to talk to our wife at home. We have not learned how to talk because we're too busy texting it on Instagram and Facebook. You haven't had a conversation with your spouse. And now you wonder why he rides to Dublin for Ruby Tuesday. Okay, I saw that. Because you ain't talked to him. You, you, you wonder why he's looking for somebody that'll sit and talk to him about football and basketball. I know you don't like football and basketball, but at least learn who, who wears number 23 or who wears number 30 and what color they got on so you can have at least one conversation with your husband. Yeah. And bro, listen, I know we don't like the stories. I don't like the have and have nots either. I don't like to watch none of Tyler Perry stuff for real, but at least learn one name of somebody on the show so you can have a decent conversation with your wife. Young people learn how to have a conversation with her. Don't text all the time. Don't send a WYD all the time at 2 o'clock in the morning. Pick up the phone at 12 in the afternoon and say, hey, girl, what you doing? Do y'all remember back in the day? Can I just keep this sermon real? Do y'all remember back in the day before text messaging? Yeah. Terrell, when you had to put on your deep voice when you called? <laughs> because there was a time when we actually talked to people. Yeah. You didn't even have a deep voice, but <laughs> here, here it is. What you watch? <laughs> what channel that's on? <laughs> because that's when we used to talk. And do you realize that many marriages and relationships held on because there was verbal conversation? <laughs> but now we sit across the table and text them while we texting somebody else. Y'all ain't gonna talk to them. Why, why, why are you sending pictures to somebody else? You sending a text to your husband or to your wife, and we wonder why relationships are better because we don't know how to talk. This text says Erica, not that he was just a dreamer, but he didn't know how to talk to his brothers, and because he didn't know how to talk to his brothers, relationship failed. If you don't know how to communicate a relationship, relationships will fail. Y'all, 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 right here. I'm having so much fun. I hope y'all have fun. It says, and they hated him more than ever because of his dream and the way he talked. Listen to this, he had another dream and he told this one to his brother, I dreamed another dream, the sun and the moon and 11 stars bowed down, watch this, watch verse 10. When he told it to his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him. Uh -huh. Two things I wanna show you right here. Another reason why relationships fail, I hope y'all take notes on this, is because some of us talk too much. Yeah. Okay, y'all, y'all like it. What, what are you saying, Craig? Listen, the first time he only told his brother, but let me help somebody in a relationship. Stop telling your mom and daddy everything going on in your relationship. Okay, so now he don't just tell his brothers, he tells his daddy. And when daddy gets involved, watch what daddy does. Daddy reprimands or rebukes. Because here's the problem, Raven. When you get in a relationship and you start involving parents and everybody else, when you get over it, they still hold on to it. And now you're tripping because your mama don't like him. It ain't your mama fault. You just 
done made up, y'all cool, everything good, and you tripping because mama turning her nose up when she come over. It's not because of mama, it's because we keep telling all our business. Sometimes you gotta learn to be quiet. You don't need to pick up the phone and call your girl and tell her what's going on in your relationship because if you're not careful, you tell your girl what's going on and she gonna start doing what's wrong. Okay, yeah, all right, I'm going to do it. You got to be careful that you don't talk too much in your relationship. Some stuff is just for you and God to have a communication about. If you got a problem with what's going on with your spouse, get on your knees and talk to God. Say, God, look, I'm tired of him leaving the toilet seat up. I don't know why he keeps leaving laundry out there. You got to have conversation with God. He involves his father now. And daddy says, I rebuke you. But here's the beauty. I hope y'all catch this. When his dad rebukes him, Joseph don't say nothing back. Oh. Why? Because you got to know when to pick your battles. Oh. Okay. All right. You, you, you want to know another reason why relationships fail? is because we don't know when to pick our battles. Because many of us think that every time something pop off, we got to make sure we get the last word. Or you got to be the loudest one in the room. Or you got to make sure you get the correction. You're going to give me the thing. You, no, you, sometimes you just got to be quiet. Even when you get corrected, even when you get chastised, sometimes you got to close your mind. Why? Because sometimes it's better to be quiet now and have an adult conversation about it later. But we got too many people that's ready to pop off, and you're going to keep popping off and popping off and popping off, and you're going to be seen. And here's what happened. Your popping off caused you to blame everybody else about what's going on. So now, you're no longer the common denominator. You're the common denominator, but just that important to why every relationship fell because he was no good, and she was no good, and they were no, you talk too much. You tell too many people, you pop off. Joseph, when his daddy rebukes him, he don't say nothing. He's quiet. Listen to this. I'm almost done. Y'all all right? I'm still all right with y'all? I'm just trying to have a loud conversation. I'm just loud. I'm just trying to have a conversation with y'all. Listen to what it says. He says, when he told his father and brothers, his father reprimanded him or rebuked him, corrected him. What's with all this dreaming? Am I, and watch this now. Let me show y'all this. Watch what happens. Am I and your mother? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let's rewind. Uh, right. Joseph's mama is dead. Right. Okay, y'all, I'm done. Y'all, y'all playing here today. Y'all ain't really. Jo Rachel is dead. Amen. Joseph's mama is Rachel. Yes. Okay, let me read it again, because y'all, some of y'all looking at me. There's a little bus. It's half the size of the other bus. When he told it to his father and brothers, his father reprimanded him. What is all this dreaming? Am I and your mother and your brothers all supposed to bow down to you? Now his brothers were really jealous. But his father pondered over the whole business. This is interesting because wait a minute, your mom is dead. Uh -huh. But here's what happens when you talk too much. People will involve people that have nothing to do with you. Ah. So, so you get on the phone and tell one person what's going on in your relationship. Now they told 12 people in your relationship. Some folks don't even know you in a relationship and they spread your business all because, Joseph, you talk too much. They have, now the daddy is involving somebody that don't even exist no more. Because when you talk too much, you tell people and they involve people that have nothing to do with your relationship. I'm done right here. I'm done. It's, it's too much. It's too hot in here, Keegan. I'm done right here. And I ain't talking about the temperature either. It is hot. You hear it. Verse 12 and 13. Listen to what it says. His brothers had gone to Shechem, where they were pastoring their father's flocks. Israel said to Joseph, your brothers are with the flocks in Shechem. Come, I want to send you to them. Joseph said, I'm ready. Hello? This is the last point, and I'm out of here. Don't let other people boost you into a relationship. Uh -oh. mm. Many relationships fail because other people encourage you that it's time for you to be ready. My God. Watch this, family. His dad says, your brothers are down pastoring the flock in Shisha. Now, Jacob already knows about Shisham because that's where his daughter got raped at. But now you're about to send your son to a place amongst people who hate and are jealous of him. Uh -huh. 
And watch this. Because Joseph honors his dad, he tells his dad, I'm ready to go to a place where people hate and are jealous of me. Here it is. Don't you get in conversation because your mama told you she's ready for a grandchild. Okay. Uh -oh. Mama said she's ready for grandchildren. The dad said they're ready for grandchildren. And now you jumping in a relationship to try to give them what they want. And you saying you're ready, but really you're not ready. If you haven't been single long enough, Joseph, you ain't ready. If you haven't given them time to heal, Joseph, you ain't ready to go down to Shisha. He's trying to go to a place and determine that he's ready based off of somebody else's encouragement. And many of our relationships fail, family, because we're so busy listening to everybody else. I know mama told you she's the cutest one, that's the one you should date. I know mama said that he's the one, but you got to make sure that you're ready, not based on somebody else. And many of us fail in relationship because here's what society said. You've been single too long. Okay, can I help a sister real quick? Your biological clock is ticking. Right now. Oh, so now, so now you're looking at all the medical bills, all the medical books, and you're trying to figure out, well, I'm, I'm, I'm close to 30 now. I'm 31, I'm 32. But where does faith come in? Because come here, Sarah. Sarah was 90 years, 89 and 90 years old. And God still did something miraculous with the seed of Abraham and got it to heaven. Okay, he, he did something amazing enough. You can't worry about all that stuff. You got to continue to walk this journey of faith. Because the reality is you can be 18 or 20 and still not be able to get it. And many of us fail in relationship because we listen to what other people try to tell us. And we let them push us, Coach P to thinking that we're ready. Yeah. And the reality is, right now, many of us ain't ready for marriage. In fact, some of us that are married ain't ready for marriage. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. the, the, it's, just, it's just fortunate and unfortunate that you are already married, so you just gotta stay there. But many of us right now that are dating ain't ready for marriage, ain't ready for dating. You've been pressed by society because society says that Geneva, you're supposed to be in a relationship, you're supposed to be with somebody, you're supposed to be confident by somebody, and it takes away the God component. Because I know we preach all the time and we say that Jesus can't hold you and Jesus is not there, but that's some nice. Yes, sir. I'm about to call that, That's some nice that uh, I, Jesus wasn't there physically, but I felt the presence in the room that kept me. So it, it's not going to encourage me, Grandmama, that I need to go get married because it's better to marry than burn. But I'm going to make sure I hang on enough because of some of the lonely nights, it don't matter if I had a wife or not. Sometimes you can be lonely in the midst of being married. Y'all yeah. ain't saying nothing. And you got to depend not on the person, not on people, but you got to depend on the presence of God. Yeah. Here's our text. Sometimes, Relationships fail because we're pressed into being ready based off of somebody else. Stand to me. Several things today, ma'am, I want you to remember. I tried to walk through it as slow as I could. So, Peaches, don't let nobody else dictate when you're ready to be in a relationship. Don't, don't let your relationship be based upon just other people's issues with God, other people's issues with their family. Make sure this month, <clears throat> as we're driving through and pressing through relationships and breaking through poor relationships, that, that you take notes and write this stuff down. Mm -hmm. Because I believe God will give us some good stuff this month on how to deal and how to break through poor relationships. <clears throat> whether you're married, whatever type of relationship you're in, whether you're dating, whether you're involved, make sure your spouse has a relationship with God. And can I say this? Relationship with God is not just them coming to church. Amen. Ask them, are they active in church? Get, just like you get their work history, get their church history. Amen. I'm in church that you attend. Ask questions. Because if a per I believe if a person don't have loyalty to God, they'll never have loyalty. That's so I want you to grab me, grab me somebody's hand. I want us to be intentional about 